Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining Jim and I this afternoon. We hope you enjoy the time you spend with us and get some real benefits from our talk today. We chose this title after seeing this meme, the meme of this tombstone a few months ago. And of course, being the inventors of the Blade PC and other innovative firsts in the PC over IP world, we thought it was pretty funny. We do find ourselves in uh, about 80% of our customer engagements helping our customers improve their enabling desktop technology by migrating them away from these traditional desktop or laptop PCs. Moving desktops to the data center has sort of been our tagline since we began in 1997. So we find affirmation in our belief that there are better models for many enterprises, whether it's VDI or VDI with grid, our Blade PCs with PC over IP zero clients, or our remote access engineering workstations, and even the cloud models with zero client and soft clients. They're all better alternatives than today's traditional distributed desktop PCs. Many times, maybe even half, it turns out that not just one solution is best, but rather a mixture of the solutions. You've always find some task workers who will do very well with VDI desktops, and then maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 percent who really need a dedicated one-to-one -one remote access Blade PC. This combined solution turns out to be much more cost effective, the most satisfying to the end user and to the IT support staff as well, and the most forward-looking solution for the enterprise, particularly as now, it's managed by a single pane of glass, whether it's ClearCube's management console or the VMware software. So we decided to PC or not to PC was a fun, lighthearted way to showcase the decision processes we go through with the customers who are facing these, a technology refresh and are wisely thinking about the other alternatives rather than just going straight forward with a standard PC technology refresh. Underneath Mr. Shakespeare are some iconic representations of the alternatives we typically see. Starting left to right along a security access, you see untethered or cloud-supported PCs, traditional VDI, new innovations in VDI which have PC over IP acceleration and grid technology. There are NIC devices, Chromebooks, thin clients, Blade PCs and engineering workstations. These devices connect to a variety of internal data center technologies or private clouds, public clouds, or some combination of all of those. Which is right for your PC transformation and why? How do you learn about the alternatives and then analyze the benefits and costs to reach that determination? What criteria need to be considered to make an informed decision? That's what we want to talk to you about today. So let's get going. In our business, the number one assumption that we make is that 95% of all enterprises are going to eventually transform their desktop infrastructure to something other than today's distributed desktop PCs, primarily in some form or fashion. It's, a, it's a, almost a competitive mandate to stay competitive, find other ways of enabling your employees. But every conversation we enter, we end up realizing that we've got two customers we have to satisfy. We've got the IT department who care about things like security, availability, manageability, utilization, and costs. And then on the other side, and we're particularly sensitive to this side, you've got the end users. And, and they're always heterogeneous user communities, but they pretty much all care about what the best performance they can get out of their machine, flexibility, mobility, the peripherals that they're going to want to connect, and their environment. Is it a comfortable environment to work in to get their job done? But they all share common goals. They all want the, the highest computing experience. They want the power and flexibility of the PCs that they use today. They want the highest security that's practical. They want the highest availability that's possible, and they would like to see the ease of management that comes from a centralized platform. So it's a real simple challenge, right? You've got to please two masters. No problem. This may be the most important slide we're going to share with you today, and we're going to return to it a number of times. 
Perhaps you've heard of Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. It's a premise about forcing yourself to embrace different perspectives as you analyze an issue. If you take a look at this slide, it shows a criteria map or a fit map, but it's just a way to codify an assessment exercise. It'll help you organize your challenges and weigh your priorities. The buckets or hats are organizational characteristics, physical characteristics, workloads, organizational state, operations and support, and available resources. So if you take a look at what this slide does, is it organizes the logic that our customers, or actually the, the way we walk our customers through helping them come to an informed decision in choosing the right path to get to where they want to go. Again, we'll come back and revisit this slide a number of times during the presentation. For just a taste of how these branches help us, so I'm, we're going to take an example and just look at one of them, the organizational characteristics, uh, dealing with the physical organization's characteristics and the state, things like security, regulations, bias, complexity, maturity, geography, user distribution, and any immutable infrastructure constraint. Things like how important is physical and data security to the company? Is the business highly regulated by law or as in one of our examples today, are there service level agreements with customers that are very stringent? Do you have an ingrained bias that leads all decisions, Windows versus Linux, uh, Mac versus PC, those kinds of things. Is your value chain integrated with your business systems? Are they integrated with all your locations? Are your users distributed? Is there reusable infrastructure? Once you do go through these and you answer the questions, it almost makes the right solution, the ideal solution, just emerge. We cover these in early in the process, in the discovery, and in the assessment phases. So remember, we're focused on the desktop. So this is all about crafting the most ideal desktop. So we want to be you know, clear up front that the traditional PCs do have benefits. It's not they're always a bad choice. It's just that we found that they are seldom the optimum choice for an enterprise. So what we've done is we've organized it, uh, the different approaches or different alternative technology approaches into various columns, if you will. So we've got the traditional desktop. We're going to go through VDI and some of the uh, decision criteria associated with why people go down the VDI path, why they choose grid, where they start using Blade PCs, and where there may be a blend for any or all of those technologies. So let's take a look at our first scenario. This is probably the most diverse project area that we'll cover today. It can range from small installations with just a few classrooms to large global organizations with hundreds of operating locations. Each may have 15 to 20 classrooms, and each classroom can have 20 to 45 seats. There are hundreds of courses, tests, and simulations to deliver year-round. So these, these testing, training, and educational environments can be a lot of fun for us to, uh, to work with. Examples that, that we have dealt with recently and over the years are officer-based, computer-based training, advancement and promotion testing, live gaming systems, unit live exercises, and mission system simulation. Those are just a few examples, and it kind of gives you a feel for the spread that we have to deal with. But the list goes on and on and on. So what we see often is a, a model that sort of looks like this hub and spoke. Um, you've got a a typical current distributed model, each classroom is filled with desktop PCs deployed in a completely distributed, decentralized fashion. That translates into hundreds, if not thousands, of distributed support processes. You imagine, each classroom has 30 desktop PCs. A branch may have thousands of courses that can be delivered. That's right. Someone has to go to each classroom to prepare for a class which entails on-site installation, on-site support, curriculum loading, antivirus patching, session setup, session teardown. It's, it's quite a bit of overhead. And all those things are necessary when things are going well, but of course if anything breaks in any one of these locations, it means scheduling people out there, travel, and downtime for the facility. Traditionally, this has been the domain for where distributed PCs have been deployed but you can start to see some of the downsides to what that is. 
now multiply it times 90 classrooms. I mean, we're working on a number of projects at a number of bases that have lots of training requirements for their, and they've got uh, problems that multiply not only on base, but from site to site. So we're going to look for a better alternative to that. Believe it or not, we've even had um, examples where the curriculum material is delivered by hand in a yellow envelope, one of those uh, internal transfer packages. Um, we're, we're starting to believe the future you know, is going to be very promising because we're starting to see the latest generation of training centers moving the workstations from the classroom, replacing them with zero clients, and putting the computing resource in a centralized data center. And they gain the benefits of almost built-in redundancy, and there are lots of automation uh, of processes. So by moving the PC to the data center, you eliminate all those problems Jen was just talking about that those distributed box PCs create. You get improved management efficiency. In the case that I was specifically thinking about, the deployment of VMware's virtualization software stack allows this organization to manage their entire environment via a single centralized interface. The customers are able to grow their capacity while actually reducing the support staff by about 60%. They're getting a higher uptime because the Blade PCs and the Smart VDI converged infrastructure with VMware deliver five nines uptime. They're having the help desk calls, and they virtually eliminate the desk side tech visits and any unplanned downtime. The workspace is uh, improved ergonomically. There's improved thermal characteristics. You know, 90% of the heat that's generated by a PC in the work environment can be replaced, eliminated. Uh, by putting the zero client in there at the desktop. There's noise reduction by replacing the desktop with a zero client. 100% of those extra noises are eliminated from the work environment. And you, the added benefit of real energy efficiency. Zero clients consume between 6 and 12 watts. And by moving those desktops to the uh, data center, your energy costs decrease an average of about 70%. That's the power and the cooling costs because whether you realize it or not, for every dollar you spend powering a PC, you're going to spend another dollar cooling where those PCs are distributed in that workplace. So these new architectures are right on, centralizing all the processes and the overhead, increasing the security, injecting these automated processes with virtual desktop infrastructure or other remote access technology solutions you share a very lightweight common desktop by the, with the zero clients at all the endpoints. You get failover, you get multi-site redundancy, and it's all supported by this active-active backup in a mesh network. So smart BDI converged infrastructure, we're seeing lots of success for this, this type of solution in these new training, testing, and educational environments. And it's really fairly easy to see how the decision criteria is arrived at in coming up with this kind of solution. Because if you look back at the map and you start looking at how they prioritize um, one aspect over another, some of these drop off because they're not relevant in each of these different situations, but others bubble to the top and help our customers make these kind of decisions. The, the ones in this particular case, uh, obviously with the training centers, is the, dyna the dynamism of the the workloads and the diversity and frequency of the data payloads, they're, they're just all over the map. There's a huge issue in uh, trying to create and update uh, and manage one image uh, cloned to hundreds of users. That, that probably is the most driving force in why VDI is being adopted into the training centers. It's do it once and then propagate it uh, as many times to as many users as you need as opposed to imaging individual PCs over and over and over again. We've seen some training centers where they actually have, because of the nature of changing from a classified environment on a trainer to an unclassified environment on a different trainer, they actually have to scrub uh, the environments. They have to wipe the disks clean, re-image them. Now, okay, if you've got one classroom, that's, that may be 30 seats, 24 to 30 seats. If you've got 10 classrooms, you can imagine the amount of time and effort that has to go into that. With VDI, 
You just clone the image and propagate it. So, you know, to PC or not to PC, well, for this particular use case, VDI is the right fit. We're going to shift to another scenario now. Um, and <clears throat> these are our, uh, an area that we're extremely familiar with, the E911 computer-aided dispatch and emergency operating center environments. They share uh, critical requirements of high data security concerns, both physical, physical security and data security. There's a very high mission criticality needing uptime and failover, five nines uptime with a speedy return to service in the event that an, uh, an outage does occur, easy moves, ads, and changes. Typically, we see Windows environments that have very highly trained users. They're always stationary, meaning they're not a whole bunch of different locations. They don't have a lot of integration. They Sometimes we'll have a CPU or GPU intensive application, but almost across the board they have very little IT staff and very few requirements for remote, for remote workers. So PCs, zero clients with VDI, VDI grid, late PCs with zero clients, you know, as you're thinking about refreshing, and another thing to mention is if you look at the life cycles of some of these desktops, in this environment they have extended the life cycles way beyond what you would find in a traditional private enterprise. So we're going to look at this problem from and kind of break it into two different components. We're going to look at the watch floor endpoint components, and then we're going to look at the data center components. So our first look at the workstation, we often see uh, four different applications at a typical E91 workstation. You need your dispatch application, you have a call taking application, you have a GIS application, and you have some sort of a tracking application. So these applications don't always work well together. In fact, in a number of cases, vendors recommend that each application has its own source. So you've got four unsecured PCs, capital intensive, noisy, hot, cluttered, failure prone, high support costs, very energy inefficient with, um, you know, three to four year life cycle. So right out of the gate, due to the need for this enhanced security, desktop PCs, you should see, they, they're not a good solution. Ideally, you'd want a small desktop package that unfailingly delivers the applications uh, with extended life cycles that are easy to support, manage, upgrade, you have no distributed data, no OS, no software to be installed. They consume very little uh, amounts of power. They're supported by a highly available, fully redundant, powerful computing resource in a secure, environmentally controlled data center. And that's what we're showing here. Watch points, the watch floor with the endpoints, and the data center with the computing resource. So if distributed PCs are not a good choice, that really leaves us two options. It's going to be either a VDI solution or what we call CDI, which is a centralized desktop infrastructure. And in that particular case, as you can see on the slide on the right-hand side, that to ClearCube means Blade PCs with zero clients. VDI may not be an ideal solution for a couple of reasons. There may be multiple systems and applications in this environment. As an example, we do have, uh, an, as Richard indicated, there are a number of vendors that require separation of their application from all others. P part of the reason is from a support perspective. So if you, if you co-populate applications on a PC, there's finger pointing exercises in case there are issues. When you separate them, then somebody has to be responsible. Uh, ultimately. So that tends to have a, a, a driving effect on what ends up being adopted in these E911 areas. But there are other things to consider. I mean, if you take a look at the peripherals involved in these type of environments, there's joysticks, there's special sound devices, um, there's special headphones, there's all sorts of special audio peripherals that don't always operate in a, uh, in a virtual environment. But, you know, again, why not VDI in this environment? Well, the biggest driver is two things, or actually are two things, cost and what is, what's determining that is the number of users that are needed to be supported in this environment. Uh, it's, it's very important to note that a centralized system with Blade PCs can also deliver the highest frame rates. So one area that tends to 
to uh, make people uh, go down the decision path toward Blade PCs is how much visual representation, how much resolution, how much frame rate uh, refresh needs to be on those, uh, those displays that the GIS operator is using. And right now, the top of the heap is, bla are, are gonna, is gonna be the Blade PC technologies. Uh, when you start taking a look at the decision criteria, other aspects start to pop up as you start going through this tree again. These are things like, how many users do I have? And is it a, is it a uh, optimum number uh, of users that is going to uh, get me into a, the, the best cost effective aspect in, in what I'm going to use to deliver the solution. It changes slightly now because what we're going to do is we're going to move from, a, from that environment, which tends to be uh, isolated to you know, 15 to 20 users, to a much bigger command and control environment. These command and control uh, C2 or C4 ISR is kind of the common nomenclature that's used. They do share, as Jim said, some characteristics with the emergency operating centers and the 911s, but in almost 100% of the cases, the, a, a differentiating characteristic is that they need access to multiple network domains, each having different security and access requirements delivered to the desktop. And there are sets of guidelines that are put in place by information assurance professionals that are immutable. They do not negotiate. These are the rules, and you follow them to the letter. Although C4ISR has kind of outpaced all the other environments in uh, ID management and authentication sophistication, you've heard about the, the recent 30-day cybersecurity sprint, I'm sure, this uh, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, um, it called a lot more attention to the multi-factor authentication requirements, uh, not only on the defense side, but also on the civilian side. Just so happens years ago, ClearCube addressed this problem head on with the design of the zero clients, our zero clients, um, with integrated multi-voltage CAC readers, especially approved for the SIPRNET usage. Um, this CAC authentication requirement, the need for along with the need for multiple levels of security to the desktop. And because of the different applications, the varied demands of CPU and enhanced GPU for applications, plus you can't be down ever any time, because I don't want to sound dramatic about this, but downtime in these environments, the C4 ISR is not measured in dollars. It's measured in uh, the safety of humans. So again, getting back to the C4 ISR environment, um, if you take a look at the slide that's up right now, this is a, a very common um, challenge for Army bases, Air Force bases, intelligence communities. I mean, it, it covers the spectrum of hundreds of thousands of people out there that have to wrestle with how to best deliver a solution in this particular environment. And it is, as we said before, it is dictated by information assurance approved standard operating procedures. So how do you solve this problem if you're using PCs? Because one of the mandates is that there has to be physical separation of the PCs uh, so that there is no bleed over of data from one network to another. You know, traditionally it's been a challenge because they're, they want to put those PCs under everybody's desk and they've got to keep them separated. So ClearCube's approach to this has been uh, quite successful. What we've been doing is we've been using a product called ClientCube. And in this particular case, ClientCube uh, packages multiple zero clients uh, and marries it to a secure KVM switch. So you ask yourself, uh, how is it that you can uh, how is it you can do this and meet information assurance uh, directives? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The reason is, is because as you can see in the diagram, the actual delivery mechanisms that are, are putting out, or to call it the sources, uh, the PCs themselves, whether they're virtual or physical, are actually located in the data center and are separated in the racks individually those runs are brought out to the endpoint device called the client cube. What's actually traversing that uh, network connection is not data. It's PC over IP protocol, and it's just pixelated uh, visuals 
that are being sent, ac sent across to the network uh, along with support for mouse and keyboard. So there is no data present. So information assurance looks at this and says, great, you've done, you've complied, you've done exactly what we wanted you to do, which is to keep the data separated in the data center. The added benefits of that is that because the data is in the data center, from a security perspective, that's exactly where you want it. You don't have to worry about anyone, um, you know, basically tampering with or exposing your network to, uh, to something that uh, you don't want them to. So, uh, Jim, I'm, I think we'll just wrap the C4ISR example up by uh, talking about applications because um, applications are king in this environment and you, this is where we have to really, it re you really separate the men from the boys in terms of applications that can be virtualized and applications that cannot be virtualized. Whether you're an Intel analyst with four displays, uh, a fusion center operator, or a UAV mission control pilot, uh, or a member of a physical surveillance team, you know, your applications may range from a legacy application that was written in COBOL during the Johnson administration to the latest Linux-based CPU, GPU intensive, real-time, satellite-fed geospatial application. And if your job requires these tools and the systems to required to run them, they are invaluable. And you can't do any work at all unless you have a, have a, a high-performance computer that can deliver um, the performance that you need. So this is where our extended Blade PC family and our engineering workstations all delivered to a zero client at the desktop fit the bill beautifully. So let's return to sum this up with our next map. So you can see how the green pops out in these uh, C4 ISR environments. Um, and there are really two different sizes that we just talked about. One relatively small, say a watch floor of 25 analysts, and a large forward major operating command with hundreds of workstations. I, again, if you just glance at the criteria that people use to weigh the most important aspects in this particular environment, it's fairly easy to see that the, the smaller number of the two enterprises are best satisfied by Blade PCs and zero clients. But more interesting, uh, and the complex use in the larger command centers is starting to be satisfied by VDI with grid adapters. The, the grid adapters, if you haven't had a chance to uh, study that type of technology, is a shared way for multiple users, virtual machines, to share a uh, GPU resource among them. And we can, we can help you through uh, the nuances between one type of environment and another type of environment. But, um, but believe me, there are distinct differences in, into how the video is being delivered out to the end users. So uh, if you, if you, again, if you start taking a look at uh, a pilot of a UAV who is getting provided a video feed from a remote access system. Sometimes those access systems may be based, as Richard said, on uh, a secure operating system. We see uh, many of them being delivered on Linux. Well, Linux doesn't play very well in the virtual world. And uh, we see blends in a lot of these cases. Again, we're talking about applications that the operating system is actually going to be the determinant as to whether or not a Blade PC is used or whether or not a BDI system with grid may be used. The commonality between these, however, is almost always a zero client, and it's dictated by the security mandates of the information assurance officers. So you're starting to see a common theme that come up in each of our presentations. We typically start with talking about, is security important to you? And it gets back into our organizational chart, if that's one of the highest aspects, if that's, a green, if that's a green line on your decision criteria, then zero clients are going to be the answer you're going to come to. And our last use case for today is the engineering design 3D modeling and simulation um, area. And it really is more of a horizontal set of capabilities that are found in many, many enterprises. Sure, some are standalone as a company, a professional services company, uh, that only does this type of work. But more often, it's a set of enabling capabilities found in thousands of different organizations. And 
for that reason, it makes it one of the most nuanced areas that we play in often. Um, unique to this group is a, uh, is a requirement for very high levels of collaboration. Uh, groups can be very dynamic, coming together for one part of a project and then disbanding very quickly while another smaller group is formed. Uh, there's also the need for frequent sharing of very large and complex files. Um, one of the other interesting attributes is the talent that you need to acquire very quickly, let's say with a spike in business, is much easier if you can let it stay where it lives and have it get involved in the project rather than having to recruit people and relocate them to a centralized location so that you can accomplish the work. Um, a lot of times this sort of need for expanding and contracting rapidly uh, is tied directly to opportunities um, that, you know, come the way of the business. Security is still important to this group, however. It manifests itself in a need to protect the client's intellectual property from theft. Like what happened with Sony Pictures. Um, firms have to comply with demanding security audits, and as one client described it to us, unannounced visitors that come into the offices and, among other things, try to slip a USB drive into a computer port on notice just to see if they can break the rules to test the, the uh, security, the physical security aspects in each of the different environments. So in a land dominated by distributed desktop computers, what drives organizations uh, to think about the concept of using VDI? Probably the biggest driver that we're seeing right now is this ability to have agile collaboration. One of the drawbacks when you're starting to do collaborative work, especially if you're using CAD environments, is the file size. When you want to transfer a file from, the, you're working on a file at, on your, uh, your desktop, and then you want to share it with someone, you've got to put that across the network. And when you have hundreds of engineers that are doing this type of work, you are absolutely choking the network and, and crimping the bandwidth down uh, by, by all these file transfers, moving files from one place to the other. We've been working on a project with uh, one of our federal systems integrators who came up with a fantastic and an incredibly innovative way to solve this problem. What they decided to do was not to move their users or their files from place to place. They decided to centralize all of their file locations also mandated by the government. The government said, you will not have these files leave the building. Oh, great. Can't have my files leave the building. But what if my workers are scattered all over the country? What if they're in Florida? What if they're in Canada? What if they're in California? What's my solution to that problem? Well, the answer was, fly them to where the files are and have them work. And, and you know, it, it sounds ludicrous, but believe it or not, the company was forced into that kind of action to try to solve that problem. Well, okay, I'm going to fly people in. I'm going to put them in hotels. I'm going to feed them. I'm going to, you know, move them away from their families for weeks at a time. Also, they can do their AutoCAD work. Are you kidding me? But believe it or not, that's exactly what they did for a six-month period of time until they discovered the solution. The solution was a combination of using a smart VDI platform or a VDI, call it a centralized VDI environment, and Blade PCs. And so, oh, how does that work? Well, what they did is they divided up the workload. Their need was to collaborate. And so not everybody is a creator. There are many more people who want to review what you did than the people who actually create the content. So in this particular case, what they did was they split the load they decided that the best delivery mechanism for the doers, if you will, were Blade PCs. So what they did is they loaded up Blade PCs with high-end NVIDIA GPU cards and created a Blade pool centrally located and gave all of the workers at all of the different locations zero clients. Those zero clients for the doers would allow them access into the Blade PCs to do their work. So for the viewers, what they decided to do, and again, the ratio was about eight to one, eight viewers to one doer, they decided to use virtual desktop infrastructure with grid cards. 
the grid cards delivered enough of the, call it the view actions, um, and, and the performance profiles that they needed to meet uh, at the best possible price point. But it, but it didn't have enough horsepower for the doers. So it was a beautiful solution. It gave them business continuity, gave them the ability to use mobile devices, zero client devices, gave them IT efficiencies, met the security mandate to have everything centrally located. A fantastic solution. And believe it or not, I mean, and we're talking about supporting a user community that numbers in the thousands. After listening to the four scenarios that we've described and how we come to this fishbone diagram and sort of think through the needs of the organization, I would suggest that probably the listeners to this talk could walk through this one themselves. Um, so we'll do it really quickly as you've just, you just uh, listened to us explain a very unique situation. The linchpin here was this dynamic need for uh, different types of employees in one location or in, in distributed locations with uh, very different display requirements, uh, different I.O. needs between the doers and the viewers, uh, different images and profiles to manage for those two different types of uh, users. Um, we had uh, very different applications that had different CPU, GPU requirements handled in two different unique ways, but that it all came together with one management interface that uh, created a unique yet uh, very cost-optimized uh, solution for, for this particular uh, engineering group. And one of the other things that will show up on this chart that haven't shown up on any of the others is actually the licensing benefits, because some of these applications used by the real doers, the creators of content, are quite expensive. And uh, they're not utilized you know, 24 hours a day by one particular user. So in the case that Jim described, these software applications being centralized, driven from a central location, can be used by multiple people at different times without having to have multiple licenses. So as, as we go through these different sort of legs of this tree um, and address each one of these little buckets of characteristics, the solutions identify themselves as you think through each one of these little touch points on this diagram. So um, we, we get back to the very final, final question, you know, to PC or not to PC. In, in these cases, it's uh, often as obvious as a nose on a man's face. Um, as Mr. Shakespeare would say. Um, these, um, the stories that we wanted to share, um, we're done with that part of it. We're, we're hoping that you may have some thoughtful questions that we'll answer at the end of the presentation. But we're going to sum, summarize this entire uh, talk uh, with the next four or five slides. So as you can imagine, the journey to, ex to assess these problems and address unique requirements can be pretty challenging. And you don't have to face it alone. We're here to help and along with our partners. So we put a framework together to help position these ideas in your technology tool bag. Users will almost always striate in some form represented by this pyramid. And a lot of what we're talking about today are ways that when, when we start to engage with you on projects, these are how we try to qualify your environment in our eyes so that we can translate your requirements into uh, deliverables that will help solve your problems. So we start to define the user types and, and match solutions in a way to get uh, a breadth of solutions uh, defined. Who do you need to satisfy in your user community? Starting with the task users, the knowledge users, the power users. Uh, we've got a variety of solutions that match those needs. So what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of Give a, give a couple of quick snapshots and to translate this into products. And so, uh, again, we're not going to dwell deeply on the product side of it, but just give you an idea how this breaks out. We have a product called Smart VDI. And Smart VDI is a, a VMware-based solution. It's, it's vanilla VMware. It uses all of the software components that is VMware um, in different configuration options with different adapters to satisfy 
the different requirements that we're talking about. If you take a look at the uh, slide we just put up, it has it's organized by user density. It's really how many users do I have in my environment and what type of uh, user are they? Are they a task user? Are they a power user or a design engineer? As you see the decrement, you know, as you see it uh, decrement down, what, you're, what we're really saying is that the higher workload uh, will obviously consume more hardware resource than the lighter workload will use. So we start to get into different densities into how much hardware you're going to need, how much software you're going to need to solve those kind of problems. And we're working toward, you know, the smart VDI solution covers a vast majority of the use cases that we see. However, we also work toward that big blue ball on the endpoint, which is those, those unique environments that have more of a, a Blade PC content. Uh, the Blade PCs also are organize themselves into uh, varieties of different densities. We've got some that uh, on our R series at the top that uh, can support as many as eight uh, Blade PCs in one small 3U chassis, and we start working our way down into uh, much more powerful uh, piece, uh, Blade PCs with higher-end GPU cards, uh, NVIDIA 4200s, 2200s, 5200s, these kind of cards that deliver very, very high graphics performance. Um, and, and we start to uh, drift toward the end of the slide into that high CPU, GPU performance criteria that may get you down to uh, one uh, dual Xeon processor dedicated with PC over IP adapters. So that's the, <clears throat> the scope of our desktop delivery solutions designed for those use cases that we were talking about today. ClearCube solutions solve the problems PCs create. Where PCs produce ergonomic distractions, zero clients are quiet and enhance the user environment. Where PCs expose data and physical assets, zero clients and remote access solutions provide real security. Hard drives and physical PCs are all in a secure data center. Where PCs and desktop management can be costly, CD, CDI and BDI provide strong return on investment and increased productivity by allowing your staff to focus on more, more of their time on critical activities within the organization. And where PCs are not energy efficient, uh, zero clients and uh, BDI solutions and blade PC solutions are far more energy efficient. So, you know, one has to, to look at this and, and really go, so is there still a place for traditional PCs at all, anywhere? And of course the answer is yes. Um, you know, in very small offices, shops, freelancers, small application developers, single transactional systems, but in those environments that have no worry about security. And that's becoming less and less, uh, uh, you can find fewer and fewer of those out in the enterprise. So that just about wraps it up for today. Uh, we want to return to that decision criteria map because uh, as we engage with you and we start to ask questions, these are the uh, ways to prepare in your mind some of the priorities that, uh, that are existing in your environment. It, it may help you, if you take a look at this uh, map, organize your thoughts into those different buckets that we talked about, those different hats that you might want to put on so you can challenge what's the most important thing to you uh, in each of these different uh, environments in, in, in terms of trying to determine what solution is going to satisfy you and your users. As Caitlin said at the beginning of the presentation, we, uh, we have recorded this presentation and um, you'll receive a copy of it if you'd like um, and a link to the entire webinar. I want to show you one more thing before we uh, get to questions. Um, when you get up close uh, with this next chart, you find the items that were in the fishbone map. Uh, I put them in a vertical axis, axis and we, we map the solutions on the horizontal axis at the top. And I only show it to you because even at this sort of 30,000 foot view, you get the overall sense of the heat map of these solutions that we've referenced today. And, you know, across the top, distributed PCs are in the left column, VDI's next, VDI with grid, C 
CDI, which is the centralized desktop infrastructure, and CVDI, which is a combination of both the virtual and the centralized environments. The dark green means that the solution is really, really appropriate for the use case with that characteristic. The lighter green, the orange, and the red show less of a match potential. Uh, maybe it's not even appropriate at all. So what we, uh, what we leave you with is our gratitude for joining us today and uh, just the knowledge that we're here to help you. Uh, and we will, uh, our contact information will be on the last uh, slide. So we're going to get to some questions. Uh, I don't see too many, so maybe we've done an okay job here. But there is one. And Jim, I'm going to ask you to, to answer this one for me. Um, we didn't dwell on this a lot, so I'm glad it came up. Can you clarify the difference between a thin client and a zero client? Sure. Uh, that, that tends to be uh, confusing to folks because the terms tend to be used almost interchangeably. But what, we're, uh, what we concentrate on in a zero client environment is the fact that a zero client has no operating system, has no local storage, has no memory. And uh, in our world, it means it's a PC over IP zero client device. Um, we're finding that uh, it's now become uh, mandated by a lot of our uh, information assurance folks that there, there is no way that there can be any uh, volatile information left on the desktops. And unfortunately, in some cases within clients, that is possible. So information assurance is driving the, the zero client initiative. Uh, and again, for us, when you see PC over IP, it means zero client. OK, thanks, Jim. Uh, Lauren, I don't, uh, I don't see any other questions on our side. Do you have any that we don't see? Uh, that is it. OK, well, we're going to give it back to you, Lauren. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate that you've uh, taken some time out of your afternoon. And we hope we can help you with a project or two. Yeah.